welcome to Brodo 2020, a conference about art, climate, and science. This is session number two, our, uh, called Time as a Muse. It's part of our programming looking at deep time, which is our theme this year. Uh, you're in for a real treat. Um, my name is Ian Edwards, I'm a producer here, and thank you to our worldwide audience for joining us and uh, exploring this um, art and science collaborations that address climate. Uh, we're coming to you from Provincetown, Massachusetts, and Provincetown is commemorating 400 years of the Pilgrims' first landing. Um, and since then, Provincetown has had many iterations, including becoming uh, the longest continuous art colony in America, uh, playing host to luminaries like Rothko and Hopper. Um, of course, art is one of the main focuses at Brodo. Uh, we think that art can inform science. We think that art can bring its point of view to science and make it more robust. So in this session, Time is Amused, we explore time as a factor in climate art, but also thinking about it as a way to inform science. In the panel, we have artists Elena Sadarakis, Jonathan Latiano, Daniel Rinali, who take us through their art and their inspirations uh, for climate and time. Uh, Julia Buntain Howell is going to moderate. She's the founder of Sci Art, Init Sci Art Initiative. Um, if you see value in this program and this se session, uh, please consider a donation. These are offered for free, but uh, we are a program of a nonprofit organization here in Provincetown. And I just want to say a couple of thanks to sponsors, including the Provincetown Cultural Council and Bay State Crooks Company. Uh, I'm really excited for this panel because it embodies so much of what Brodo is. Uh, big ideas, interdisciplinary efforts, uh, a deeper understanding of what potential is. And so uh, immediately following this pre-recorded session we will doing, be doing a live Q&A. So register your, your questions in the Q&A chat box and uh, let's get on with the session. Time is a muse. Hello everyone, it is a pleasure to be gathered here at Virtual Brodo for Time as Muse. My name is Julia Buntain Howell and I'll be moderating this panel featuring the three artists Jonathan Latiano, Elena Sotarakis, and Daniel Bernali. So this panel discussion will focus on time, time as a concept, time as an inspiration, time as a perspective. We're focusing on time because the concept of time permeates our attitudes, research, and solutions for climate change. When considering deep time, a geological history of about 4.5 billion years, we're looking at the history of our planet. So how does the notion of this deep history influence our thoughts and actions in the present and our solutions towards our future? Artists are adept at developing conceptual frameworks to operate within. The idea of an artwork is a multi-dimensional conceptual object of the mind, and the work is the expression and encapsulation of that concept. The idea has constraints and rules which are navigated in the physical making. In the physical making, new constraints arise and in turn feed back into the idea through problem solving and flexible thinking, a solution arises in the form of a completed artwork. Albert Einstein famously said, after a certain high level of technical skill is achieved, science and art tend to coalesce in aesthetics, plasticity and form. Mm -hmm. The greatest scientists are always artists as well. Mm -hmm. So here at Brodo, thinking about time within the context of climate change, what can artists bring to the table? How can their perspective on time expand our visions and plans for the future? What can an artist's working method of conceptual frameworks and flexible thinking add to the science of climate change solutions? How can artists meaningfully be incorporated into these scientifically rooted but culturally present conversations about climate and sustainability? These are some of the questions we'll explore together here. So without further ado, I will briefly introduce our three panelists and get this conversation going. Jonathan Latiano's work weaves between science fact and science fiction, alluding to the more elusive qualities of our environment and our own uncertain future on this planet. He has exhibited in numerous solo and group public art exhibitions in cities including New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, DC, and London, England 
and his work has been featured in local, national, and international art publications. Jonathan maintains his studio practice in Boston, Massachusetts, and serves as the director of the studio arts program at Merrimack College. Elena Sotarakis is a Brooklyn-based artist, curator, and educator. She is the co-founder of BioBat Art Space, a gallery dedicated to the intersection of art and science, located on the ground floor of a biotech incubator in the Brooklyn Army Terminal. She is a founding member of the International Space Initiative, Art Space Art Initiative, Beyond Earth, a multidisciplinary project and exhibition series that explores the new frontiers of space and art. Her work explores environmental degradation in the age of the Anthropocene. She has recently participated in exhibits at the Matsudo Science and Art Festival in Tokyo, Japan, Spring Break Art Show in Los Angeles, among others. And lastly, but not least, Daniel Rinaldi has been working as a visual artist for over 45 years. Although largely situated within the medium of photography, Rinaldi's work can often be characterized as conceptual or environmental. The work is frequently rooted in the balance between control and chance, such as the unforeseen results in the photogram, the found scrawls on a classroom chalkboard, or the path of a snail in wet sand. His work is in the permanent collections of over 30 museums here and abroad, including the Museum of Modern Art, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the National Gallery of American Art at the Smithsonian. So um, we're going to get started now. The first question I would like to pose to this panel, starting with John, is how does time and climate inform your art? For my work, um, the perception of time, in particular deep time, is probably the greatest driving force behind my artwork. Because of this, my artwork often revolves around scientific fields like geology, evolutionary biology, and paleontology, which I find um, having to be really excellent vehicles for talking about the perception of time. And also because I happen to live during this period in our species history, it's impossible not to speak about the current climate crisis, which is, of course, the greatest existential threat that we've yet to face. In this installation here, Points of Contention, I created a crystalline geological formation that appeared to be physically erupting out of the floor of the exhibition space. The crystalline form is made out of materials that have a half-life of about 10,000 years before they begin to break down. So materials like styrofoam and various types of plastics. And when you talk about a material's life cycle on that vast amount of time, you really begin to think about it in geological terms. By having the artwork emerge out of the existing gallery floor or the existing gallery space, I, I felt that that heightened both not only the geological qualities of the artwork, but also the viewer's own spatial awareness within the installation. The artwork was coated in a salt solution that slowly evaporated and crystallized throughout the length of the installation. This allowed the piece to not only depict crystallized growth on a geologic scale, but actually grow through crystallization during the exhibition. Throughout my practice, I repeatedly return to specific materials that embody a feeling of geologic time. Here in the installation, existence and properties are inferred. I focus on the material petroleum as a subject matter. And, and this is a, a material that I've returned to many times in my practice. I, I have a kind of guilty obsession with petroleum. I am absolutely fascinated with the stuff through the lens of deep time. I mean, it's, it's literally compressed dinosaurs, right? And yet, this is a material that is strangling our society ecologically, economically, and geopolitically. I created this installation primarily out of petroleum-based materials, uh, mainly color-shifting automotive paint, and about 3,000 pounds of reclaimed asphalt. The work depicts a kind of strange globular cluster of color-shifting boulders 
floating in a science fiction asphalt landscape of geologic formations. The title, Distance and Properties Are Inferred, was taken from the Wikipedia page for Dark Matter. And I, and I feel like that phrase, existence and properties are inferred, it, it's pretty spot on when talking about the future of both our planet and our species. And then, you know, lastly, much of my work embodies a sense of ephemerality. So here in my installation, Flight of the Baji, I created a memorial to the recently extinct Baji River dolphin that lived in the Yangtze River in China. The work depicts a pod of 14 hand-carved Baji River dolphin skeletons uh, created out of personally collected drift, uh, freshwater driftwood. The skeletons emerge out of a pile of driftwood at one end of the gallery. They fly through the space and then they dissolve into this kind of setting sun on the opposite wall. It's an artwork about trying to better understand and have a dialogue with a creature that was brought to extinction through human actions. I spent <clears throat> months collecting these materials um, in local rivers and, and lakes, the closest thing I could get to the Baji's natural environment. And then, you know, meticulously carving each of the individual bones by hand. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is the piece is really a monument to failure. I, I will never truly know the Baji. Um, no one ever will. This species is gone forever. After the run of this exhibition, the installation was meticulously disassembled and it will purposefully never be exhibited again. And, and that's the thing about time and impermanence. We human beings, we, we like to think things will last forever. But the fact is that many things, right, such as like polar bears and coral reefs, are about to not exist. We continue on this current trajectory. Uh, I've found that the impermanence of these artworks can really affect how the viewer reads them, which I, I feel personally heightens the impact and resonance of the artworks and the concepts behind them. Yeah, time and climate pay play a very large role in the creation of my work, and it's something I think about quite a bit, um, particularly when Paul Kurtzman popularized the term Anthropocene. Um, it really helped me have a deep understanding of geological time and how um, humankind is altering the surface of the earth and the impact that we're having. Um, and in some ways, I think of time uh, also as a limited resource. I feel like as a civilization, we're in a race against time. I also uh, feel as if we're C students cramming the night before an exam for a test um, and we're you know completely unprepared and I think that that sense of climate anxiety and that psychology very much is a part of my work um, and I'm thinking very much about the perils of the second half of the 21st century um, so if you want to queue up the slides this is called not a drop to drink I'm really thinking about drought extreme climate events political instability war uh, I'm particularly referencing the Syrian civil war, which was caused by drought, uh, and making the connection between um, extreme climate events and climate refugees. Uh, this image is also thinking about the second half of the 21st century, particularly tw the year 2050, where we're going to have more plastic in the oceans than um, sea life, and feeling as if we're a civilization drowning in plastic and waste and debris. Uh, and this piece is made with oil, mixed media, and collage. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner that um, I'm actually collaging in plastic bags and waste. And in most of my work, the natural landscape is painted in oil. Uh, and then the detritus and debris is um, uh, created from discarded magazines and, and waste looking back 100 years and going from 2050 back to 1950, um, going back 100 years. And in this piece, The Lawn Maker, um, I'm, I'm looking a lot of um, 50s imagery because it's the advent of suburban consumer culture. Uh, we have large scale industrialization. And this time period really laid the groundwork for the major environmental issues that we play, um, face today. Uh, I'm also making work about adaptation and how as a human species we're very adaptable, but that can also be um, 
a negative thing. And in this piece, we have um, young kids who, uh, you know, are used to skiing in the winter and there's no snow. And then they're making a ski jump out of debris and waste and feeling like as a civilization, that's something that we do quite a bit. We just adapt and get used to things um, instead of trying to actively change them. I have, I have this piece um, called Mountain of Garbage. And again, I have that like 1950 suburban consumer waste in this pile of garbage we have a minivan and in the ch in the center of the pile i have a boy uh, sort of in the eye of a storm and i'm also referencing the shape of a hurricane in this piece this piece is called fracking pit um and it's documenting the park pockmarked landscape of our 21st century it's also highlighting um the destructive nature of extracted industries and thinking about time in relation to fossil fuels and this is something that jonathan touched upon um you know, these fossil fuels are made from remnants of organisms that date back, you know, 650 million years and we're uh, radically changing the surface of our earth to extract them. Um, and our next, the next piece I'd like to queue up is uh, called um, uh, Lake George. And uh, this is not my piece. Um, in this work, I'm looking back to art history of the landscape painting of Martin Johnson Heath. And this is a painting from 1862. Uh, he was a Hudson River painter. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see how I'm referencing and quoting this work to then um, impose 21st century uh, imagery on top of uh, the piece and showing um, kind of what will happen and a precursor if we don't protect our natural um, preserves and, and national parks. Um, and in the next slide, uh, you'll see um, on the left, those are this is a triptych that I created with three different scenarios of 21st century degradation. And then on the right hand side, you have the original piece that I'm referencing. Um, this piece, uh, Maternal Wasteland, um, you know, I'm thinking about time in relation to planned obsolescence and electronic waste and the waste that's forming a new layer of our Earth's crust and um, and how manufacturers are building in an end life for electronic um, products that then end up in landfills and we end up sending them off to other developing nations. And uh, the imagery of the woman pushing the double-sided baby stroller, uh, I sourced that from, um, I took a picture of someone in my neighborhood and then inserted that into this landscape. Uh, and it's interesting because a lot of people, when they see this, they assume that this is some sort of like futuristic dystopian uh, landscape and in reality in a lot of countries like India uh, this is uh, the environment that people are living in every day and you will see women and children um, you know traveling through terrain like this um, this is called better Morrow. this is one of my most recent pieces um, and this is based on present-day events I'm referencing the COVID pandemic um, and making connections between the destroyed natural habitat that creates the perfect conditions for COVID-19 to emerge um, and really thinking about how we're all living on one planet and this shows that we're not existing in isolation and then you'll also see uh, in the foreground I have uh, medical waste and debris and that's something that I've been seeing quite a bit in my neighborhood in Brooklyn that I was kind of surprised at the pandemic of how much medical waste I've seen strewn on the streets um, and it just makes me think about how we were warned about uh, this pandemic could be coming and we're being warned about climate change and how um, maybe this pandemic will change our views on climate change. In a lot of ways, I sort of jump back and forth between the micro and the macro. And I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects I've worked on. Around 1995, I did this piece using a very iconic monument from Provincetown's architecture. And it was done actually as a Fine Arts Work Center project for raising funds. And I, I sort of thought, well, you know, nobody's going to like this. I made it in 1995 and I put the date summer, high tide summer 2024, which then seemed like a very distant date, but the piece still keeps popping up in exhibitions and 2024 is, is right around the corner now. Um, but anyway, it became the catalyst um, for the remapping project. And so what I did was to take these US geodetic survey maps, because I love the way they look. I think every artist has a thing for maps, but um, I scanned them at a very high resolution and then literally by hand, um, move the water into the first 10 foot isobar. There are these isobars throughout uh, the maps. And there was something about not using some sort of software to predict what the uh, outer cape would look like, but rather pushing the water up 
physically by hand with the stylus, if, if anyone thinks of the computer as being a hand, hand working process. Uh, so that's what it looks like after 10 years. This is Provincetown, a close up of the same slide. Um, you can see that we now have Airport Harbor rather than an airport. Um, and there's a, uh, now there's a toll bridge uh, leading from Truro into, into Provincetown. So then I decided, well, what happens if we go 20 years out, uh, 20, 20 feet out, 400 years out? Nobody ever thought 10 foot would happen. Um, but then you have these large singular weather events like Hurricane Sandy. So you can predict, oh, three inches every 10 years. But then all of a sudden a storm comes along, a 500 year storm, a 100 year storm, and it wipes out you know, an enormous amount of land. So this is what uh, the Cape would look like with a 20 foot rise in sea level. This is a, a close up of, of Provincetown, which is now an archipelago rather than uh, a real land mass. And uh, in order to live here, I would say one would need a boat, uh, regardless of how one survived. And this is uh, Truro down toward Wellfleet with the same 20 foot rise. This is the comparison of the two uh the 10 and the 20 foot rise for provincetown and you can see how much more damage there is in the 20 foot rise in sea level and again you know whether this is possible or not uh that's one of the things i like about making art is you don't have to worry about the possible so the impossible becomes possible and so uh I don't know whether it's science and people sometimes when this piece has been exhibited, the 10 foot one, they're looking for their houses, you know, where is my house? Is it going to survive? And I say, well, remember, this is art, not science. I don't know whether your house will survive or not. So the next series um, is something I call daily observances. And uh, what I do is every morning I walk down to the bay very near where I live in roughly, um, if you know, these pilings are the leftovers from the old Chiquesset neck in. And I make a photograph with exactly the same composition. And I do it every day. And if I'm lucky and the wind's blowing the right way, I actually can hear the church bells at seven o'clock. And that's when I um, click my shutter. So it often feels like kind of a, a meditation or a sort of secular prayer, if you will, to walk down and take a look at this. Uh, next slide. I've been doing it really since 2011 on and off. And uh, in some ways, there's this very simple composition, and it's minimal in certain ways, but there's an enormous amount of detail here. And everybody who's spent time on the shore knows that the light can change every single day. Uh, the texture of the water changes. Sometimes it looks like glass. Sometimes it's choppy. The sky goes from blue to white to non-existent. Uh, the horizon line disappears. Um, and so I continue to do this uh, every year, trying to do it as many days in a row as I can. Uh, and again, pay, it, for me, it's about paying attention to the small things. And uh, there, there is just something about experiencing it day after day after day, which is what I mean by sometimes the micro becomes the macro. At times, there's uh, a walker along the beach, the second slide on the, uh, from the top left, and at other times, a, uh, a clamorous truck will appear, a boat will uh, go out to sea. This is last summer where I did um, 123 consecutive days. Uh, so this is basically from June 1st well into September. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't printed this piece or exhibited. Usually they're, they're printed and shown as 28 days, seven days across for four weeks, uh, which seems like a calendar in a way. Uh, but I don't put the dates other than at the bottom to say what the total stretch of, of time is. Now, this is a series I'm working on now called Fire and Ice. And again, it starts, I like to, to sort of borrow other imagery, whether it's topographic maps. And in this case, um, I, I borrowed NASA satellite photographs of uh, extreme weather events at times. The, the center row, and you'll see this in each example from this series, uh, the center row here is is work of my own, but it, but in each case, I, I, I use the NASA images to trigger something. Uh, at the top are, are wildfires, and each of the wildfires is named in the piece. I, I won't go into that now. And at the bottom are a series of named storms, hurricanes. 
in the middle are um, the nests of birds printed as negative images. And birds, of course, one of the things I like to reference in this is a sense of geological time, birds being uh, direct descendants of uh, dinosaurs. Th this piece is also uh, based on um, a fire, a wildfire in China, and uh, a glacier in the Antarctic. And even though these images sometimes depict, depict really horrible events that affect people's lives in very negative ways, when we get far, it's, it's, it's about getting far enough back so you don't really see that. And what we see is a certain kind of beauty to the planet. And whether we're there or not, that beauty is there. Um, and in this case, along the bottom are a row of horseshoe crab tails. Um, one of the longest lasting species that still is around. I think they go back uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. They'll probably outlast us. We don't seem to be doing so well. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I included the horseshoe crab tails in this one. And this one uh, uses again a fire and Antarctic ice. Uh, the birds again, referencing what I talked about before with the bird's nest, this is a sort of flipped um, for a long time, I photographed birds that had sort of died on the beach, if you will, or died and fell to the beach. <coughs> and, and I think that one of the things about feathers and birds is, is when a bird is on the beach and, and its life is passed, it, it doesn't always look that bad. There's a sheen to the feathers that remains. And, and in this case, flipping it around it almost looks like ice, but it's not. Um, but the negative image does that. Uh, again, uh, Canada, a Canadian fire and Hurricane Irma uh, and Russian ice. And then this time a dying forest. We have a number of sort of saltwater um, wetlands that are killing trees as they encroach on, on land with higher, higher levels of sea level that even I've noticed having been on the Cape for 35 years or whatever it is, um, I noticed the difference. And I think anyone who's been there for any length of time begins to notice that. So, you know, in this piece, I think a lot about the Robert Frost poem. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. Um, and I sort of have the poem tacked up in my studio and, and think about it um, so quite a bit. I think that's... Next question, getting a little bit deeper here. Um, from each of your perspectives, if you could say just a couple of things about um, how, how do you think an artist's perspective, whether it's you know an artist in general or speaking from your own perspective as an artist, um, how, can, how can your point of view or how can the point of view of the arts um, on time and on climate inform science, inform the way we approach science, uh, do science, um, what have you. Um, so yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to start, John. Okay. Yeah, happy to. Um, so, and you know, I, I think that's such a great question, Julia. And I mean, so first off, right. You know, I think, I think scientists and science communicators are already, they're already pretty good at their ideas. You know, I, I think of people like Carl Sagan or E.O. Wilson as really good examples of this. So where I think one of the ways that the artist's point of view really becomes relevant here is by finding and illuminating less conventional angles to look at and approach scientific problems, you know, and, and also, you know, just for the record, this is a two way street. Artists working alongside and actively collaborating with scientists, I believe tend to really breed incredibly creative and innovative artistic breakthroughs, both in material and theory. I think a good example of this that I recently experienced personally was a collaborative project that I helped create at Merrimack College where I teach. And this was an extracurricular project that I developed with my colleague, Dr. Charlotte Burks in the biology department, where we teamed up student scientists and student artists to create an exhibition of Petri dish based artworks using different bacteria samples. So, you know, and, and while, you know, these 
the artworks that the students made, I felt they came out pretty successful. The true value of this collaboration was the lessons gained by putting artists and scientists in the same space, working alongside each other, adding their own perspective and viewpoints to the work at hand. And really, at the end of the day, you know, the, the art students gained a unique insight into the act of art making. And the biologists gained a different understanding of these strains of bacteria that they had already spent hundreds of hours working with. So I think it's less about interpreting the data and more about providing a collaborative conversation to create a metaphorical framework to spur on scientific innovations that maybe wouldn't have been arrived at otherwise. Um, time, especially deep time, is an abstract concept, all right? Um, and at least to like, I, I feel like human brains, right? Because we've kind of evolved to perceive things in our very, right? Like short lifespans, relatively short lifespans. And so who better to team scientists up with than artists whose training and expertise is specifically in abstract and metaphoric thinking. And as for the climate crisis, I mean, the innovations that need to you know, that we need to come up with for the solutions, right, to this crisis, those innovations are still being imagined. And the scale in which those solutions need to be implemented on is a scale that has never been attempted by our collective society. Many of these scientific problems will require new perspectives and unconventional thinking, which is one thing, right, that collaborating with and working alongside artists, you know, I believe really tends to yield. Yeah, of course. And I'm going to second what Jonathan said about how collaboration, I think, is key. And I think breaking outside of your traditional roles as artists and scientists is really key and interdisciplinary work. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why I founded Biobat Artspace was to create a um, uh, a place where there's dialogue between um, artists and scientists. And there are many scientists who are artists and artists who pursue scientific pursuits. And um, I think that you, as an artist, it's really important to understand that you can have a tremendous impact. And one artist in particular, who is a huge inspiration of mine, who I'd like to reference today, if you could cue up the slide, um, I think who's an important part of this discussion is Agnes Dennis. I don't know if you guys were able to see her retrospective at the shed uh, that happened this past winter, but um, she has this project called Tree Mountain, where it's um, uh, a, a thousand living trees um, and a thousand people uh, over 400 years, and she created this living time capsule. So she, uh, you know, is transforming um, space that had uh, been abandoned and was a coal mine. And then she, uh, you know, teamed up with the UN and uh, the, the government of Finland. And I think doing these like, ambitious large scale projects that that get artists outside of the studio, I think is, is an impressive thing to do. And the fact that she's thinking about this land use over 400, 400 years, um, I think is a very exciting way for people to be thinking about time. Uh, this is a quote that I think really sums up her practice and is very significant. She says, we live in an age of complexity when knowledge and ideas are presented faster than can be assimilated. Kind of talking about how technology is moving faster than our wisdom. And while disciplines are becoming progressively alienated from each other through special Organization. The hard-won knowledge accumulates undigested, blocking meaningful communication. Clearly defined direction for humanity is lacking. The turn of the century and the next millennia will usher in a troubled environment and troubled psyche, making our today synonymous with assuming responsibility for our fellow human beings. A lot of what my two predecessors have said is, is certainly how I feel. One of the things that I guess is the most important to me is, is something I call paying close attention. And I think that's what all artists do to some degree, but um, really paying close attention to what you see, to, to sit in front of something and spend a half an hour looking at something that ordinarily maybe we would only spend a couple of minutes looking at. And I think when I first got involved in photography and began to really see the power of photography, it was because sometimes a photograph makes it possible to see things we wouldn't see with our eye. 
and not just because of macro views or, or micro photography, but simply because it, it forces you to look closely at this image that of something that you've maybe seen a hundred times. I think you can think of Edward Weston's uh, peppers or his cabbage or something like that. But and I think that scientists also do this. So I think that the idea of of close looking and of course. 150 years ago, almost every scientist had to take a drawing class because drawing was one of those things that made you look very closely at something. If you drew it, you knew it. And I think that that's something that artists have, have had to um, do as well. So I think making, making people hyper aware of something that's in front of them or maybe that they haven't seen before. I, I did a long series um, that, that continues to this day where I would walk along um, the tidal plane and, and collect um, snails. Um, I was very good to them. And I would arrange them in geometric patterns and photograph them sort of aerially straight down. Uh, and they would make drawings in the wet sand. And there was no control. Uh, I felt like a choreographer whose dancers had no interest in listening to me. But uh, I began to learn something about how the snails behaved. I learned for one thing that um, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't move very much if there was an incoming tide. They must have sensed the water underneath them coming toward them, or uh, maybe they remembered yesterday that, <laughs> that this happened. They have very, very, very small nervous systems that I, su I suppose don't even constitute brains in any, any real way. Um, I also noticed that um, they didn't move if it was very, very hot on the 90 degree days when I would go out there and lug my tripod and camera down to the beach. Um, they just didn't move. And I discovered there was, a, there was a set of perfect conditions, if you will. And it had to be an incoming tide. The light had to be sort of low so that it, it, it showed the marks in the sand. And I realized that I was learning something about the behavior of this funny little uh, animal. And at, at one point I had gotten a, a, a grant from uh, this organization called Sea Grant, S-E-A Grant, uh, which is out of the University of Rhode Island. And it was for the snail drawings. And so I said, well, I'd love to come down and talk to the scientists about what I've learned. And there are more things I've learned about snails than just that. And I never got an answer. And I thought, well, you know, that's weird. Um, but I think that what we're moving toward is a situation where there is much more collaboration. And I think um, artists can do a number of things. One is certainly provide this observation that helps us understand the world a little better. But secondly, and I think this is what Elena was talking about with Agnes's work, and I think of Mel Chin also, who, who does this work where um, he, he discovered certain plants were what he called heavy accumulators. I think that's what he called them. And you could plant these in toxic waste sites and they would uh, absorb lead and mercury and certain other contaminants that were in the soil. Um, and, and I think that's a kind of interventionist role that, that artists have begun to play as well. And Mel's work goes back at least 20 years. Um, and I, I think there are quite a few artists who, who want their work to literally not just observe and point out a problem, but to, but to try to solve the problem with the artwork itself. And I think that's, um, that's new to the 20, 20th century, 21st century. And I think, I, I hope we see more and more of that. Certainly, yeah, I mean, that's that's a great segue into kind of our, our last uh, couple of minutes we have with each other where I wanted to touch a bit upon, you know, how art can help resolve the climate crisis. Um, but I, I wanted to say that I, I love this. I love what you mentioned about how, of course, you know, before we had recording devices, scientists would have to, you know, draw whatever they were studying so they could bring back these drawings to wherever they would travel to and, and share their findings with their colleagues. Um, and, and what if it is, you know, drawing as a form of knowledge um, that we're missing from modern day life? Even, um, you know, even art students don't necessarily have to learn how to draw from life anymore as technology advances and digital practice becomes much more prevalent. Um, so are, are we losing something? Have we already lost something there? Uh, very possibly. <laughs> um, so we only have a few minutes left with each other. Um, so I would like to pose um, a, a challenge to each of you. Can you give me like one or two or three sentences on how you think 
art can help to resolve the climate crisis. Of course, resolve is a very broad word, as is the climate crisis. Um, perhaps it's through behavior, perhaps it's through a physical action, perhaps it's through an astounding artwork which changes the point of view of everyone. Um, so yeah, whoever wants to answer first <laughs> can go ahead. But I'm, I've never been sure whether art can change the world regardless of what the issue is that it addresses, whether it's whether it's war or violence or um, climate change or the destruction of the environment. But I think we do have the ability to sensitize people. And I think that's a role that I hope artists continue to play in a, in a very significant way. In some ways, the whole uh, COVID-19 pandemic is the result of not paying attention, not just to scientists, but, um, but what global capitalism has done to our lives and how is it that the richest country in the world didn't have enough PPE or ventilators? And I think, again, uh, global capitalism seeks the lowest cost of labor and capital. And that means exploiting third world people. And we've done that with the environment. And we've done it in every other way. And I, I, I even feel that the art world's at fault as well, and that we have our own 1% with 1% of the galleries and 1% of the artists basically controlling, you know, 90 nine percent of of income and sales and we're going to watch a lot of small and medium-sized galleries disappear in the next next few months and i know that's not exactly on topic but um i think if the galleries disappear and if museums suffer the opportunity for artists to share their vision of the world and what needs to be done um, is very much diminished or changed maybe maybe it's a question of yeah. adaptation Right. As, as I would love it if we could change change the system. <laughs> yeah, and, and as someone who's running an art space at this time, you know, I was kind of thinking about the predicament that we're all in as an artist who's painting with a limited palette, how, you know, sometimes restrictions you, can be a good thing and to uh, work within those restrictions and invent new things and invent new platforms to share our work. And I think especially in the time of COVID, the most important thing that artists can do is ask questions and have a dialogue and create a global dialogue. And I think that a better future is not just going to be handed to us. We have to envision it. And I think that that's something that artists do very well. We're really great at being visionaries. And just one last thing that I think um, is one way that the arts um, might help the scientific community is that you know, artists are always outliers and um, operate outside of establishments and are kind of anti-establishment to begin with. And I think that with fighting climate change, we're going to need like very big, radical new ideas. And those ideas may not be embraced by scientific institutions and establishment. And I think if there's any scientists out there that are doing radical new work that isn't being embraced, I think that the artist community might be a great way to disseminate that information, to collaborate, to uh, express that knowledge in other ways. And that like if you're as an artist or a scientist hitting walls and your work uh, isn't getting out there, um, that by teaming up together and, and that cross-pollination can be really powerful. I mean, to go off of what Elena was just saying too, it's like, yeah, to solve this climate crisis, I, I think it's going to take massive social engineering projects, right, that will have, that will require an incredible amount of resources, right, to do. And so how do the citizens of those countries that are implementing right, these changes on a social level, on a material level, right, on a technological level, how do those get, how does that get accepted, right, and woven in, into society? And, you know, on one hand, like, I think that's where, like, design also comes in, right? If these things are beautifully designed and they enhance the aesthetic of a city, um, I, I think that that is, that is one way where we can just right away actively, right, begin to really participate in that. And then to, you know, go off of what Daniel was saying, I mean, I think it's, I think it's empathy, right? It's like empathy may be the thing that's lacking most in the world right now. And, and in, in the case of climate change, I mean, it's empathy towards the generations that come out of us. And it's the, it's empathy that is, and the children being born right now. Right, and that ability to look beyond what is immediately in front of us, and you know, um, yeah, and, and and heighten that sense of empathy. 
Well, that is as good a note to end on as any. Um, I want to thank you guys so much for being on this panel, sharing your amazing artwork and and thoughts. And I, I think some really good ideas started to bubble up here. Um, the issue with these panels is we only have so much time, right? I wish we could continue the conversation, but that's what Brodo is for. So um, I, I hope that for everyone who tuned in that you're able to tune into the other sessions as well. Um, also, be sure to check out Brodo's website. There is a time-sensitive virtual exhibition of artworks um, which explore these themes in more detail and depth. Um, so yeah, thanks again, um, Elena and Jonathan and Daniel for, for being here. And, and thank you all um, out there for tuning in. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, so we're in the Q&A now, as far oh. as I can tell. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if the screen's going to change, but that's fine. We can certainly start the conversation. Um, so uh, to everyone who is out there tuning in, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I, I hope that you have many questions to ask us. Again, please use that Q&A box on the side of your um screen there we have a number pouring in right now i wanted to selfishly ask the first question uh, so we recorded this session with each other a couple of weeks ago and i personally feel like time is getting increasingly weird um it's harder to remember what day it is the time of day hasn't mattered as much um you know certain things are still very normal we have to go to work we have to do certain things etc but time is getting kind of weird and i was wondering as an artist you know how time has affected your art practice how it's affected your kind of modes of making during this strange time that we're in right now and if there's any way that we can apply anything we've learned about time since we're experiencing it in such a different way right now to thinking about these big picture problems like climate change. So this is for anyone on the panel who's brave enough to start us out. Well, I think during this time um, that a lot of people are referring to as the great pause, um, there's a lot of time for reflection and thought. Um, and I think that in normal times, people's bandwidth aren't um, open enough and, and everyone's so busy with life and daily tasks that maybe now people have more time to think about deep time and climate and how COVID um, relates to climate change and to reassess our ways of thinking and working and relating to each other and the earth. And so I'm hoping that um, this time, which for me feels like a slowdown. Um, you know, I have the luxury to work from home right now. And so for me, it feels slow, but for other people, it may not feel that way. But for me, it definitely feels like my individual time um, feels quite slow. Um, you know, there was something that um, one of the panelists in the last talk said, which is um, time is both regular and irregular. And I feel like during this pandemic that, I, you know, I, I feel that more than ever, we're like, yeah, some sometimes it's like days drag on, you know, for much longer than they seem physically possible to. And other times I'll step back and be like, what happened to this this week? Right. Like, where did that go? And so it's I, I think a lot of people are experiencing this fluctuation. It's constantly s speeding up, slowing down um, for my my own practice, it's, you know, I have been kind of separated from my studio space during this time and I've, and I've used it for reflection and, and, and writing and, you know, really, you know, thinking about, the, you know, in some ways the immediate future of, of the art world and how are we going to bounce back from this. Um, it's interesting too when I mean when I think about this like speeding up and slowing down it, in my work that is one thing in these installations that I make and it's why I work in installation sculpture and 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 create these spaces that the viewer can not only walk into but move through how can I get them to kind of slow down a little bit that's why a lot of 
the work activates the floor, these things that you actively walk onto. Um, and then at other times, like, can they move more quickly through the space? And can I do that without telling them to do it directly in the work? So that, that, that fluctuation is something I'm constantly thinking about. I would say that. Oh, uh, sorry. I was going to ask you if you had any thoughts about that. <laughs> okay. Um, for me too, I think it's, it's felt like a, a sort of a stop time. Um, I haven't felt very good about re-engaging physically with the work I do or making new work. Um, I think writing and reflection, as Jonathan was saying, um, have been part of my daily routine, studio routine as well. I'm fortunate uh, as Elena is in that um, my studio is here in the loft I live in. So um, I can go to it, but sometimes I go to it and I think, well, what do I do today? Um, because what, what tomorrow will be the same. And, you know, I've had a couple of shows and projects postponed or canceled or whatever. And those things always kind of give you something to work toward. And I, I think we'd work anyway. I'm not saying that you have to have a show in order to keep working, but um, there's a finite moment there. And, and this period feels like um, time has almost been removed. And um, so it's, uh, I think it is very difficult. Yeah, and my and Daniel to go off of that. I mean, a lot of my work is very reactionary to the space and 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 exhibition driven. I can yeah. think about these large works only so much until it's time to find a space for them and start building them. And yeah, I've I've also had you know some exhibitions postponed, and you know we're talking like postponed you know up to a year. I think if I'm lucky, um, and so it's interesting. In some ways, this is an opportunity for me too to step back and, in, in, in theory, in, you know, innovate a new way to work um, without these uh, things that I'm, I'm actively building to, without the actual like dimensions of the space to respond to. Yeah, it is um, that, that phrase that I go back to when I need to, uh, constraint breeds creativity. Hopefully we can all find a way to make that true for ourselves. Um, although, the constraints right now are massive, <laughs> um, especially, yeah, um, in, in so many ways, on so many levels. Um, okay, so I'm gonna take a look at some of these questions here. Um, there are a couple of topics which people are circling around, so I'm gonna be combining some questions. Um, one question that came in, which I think, uh, all of you can speak to um, is what are concrete steps that artists can make or take uh, to introduce themselves effectively to the scientific or engineering community? Um, so, you know, all of you have experienced um, either working across disciplines or seriously engaging another discipline within your work. And I think, uh, in this question, you're speaking to artists out there who are interested in, in taking those steps like you have. I think one thing that artists can do if they're looking to collaborate um, with the scientific community is, is to, to have a clear idea of what that collaboration would look like and, and what member of the science community they want to work with and then try to find institutions that they're linked with or residencies like um, Benjamin Durand's has Integral Molecular. Um, Julia, I know you do a lot of um, science um, resident, like virtual residencies with SciArt Center. Um, and I think going to um, places like Leonardo um, and those communities, uh, I think, I think going to live events um, or Zoom events where there's that collaboration is the emphasis of the meetings um, can be really helpful. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, it's really hard to introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know, never mind if they don't quote unquote speak your language. Um, so if you go to introduce yourself to a scientist or someone that's outside of your own discipline, even if you know, you're a digital artist and you're going to try to talk to, you know, a fiber artist. Um, don't don't assume any level of knowledge. Um, be humble, be friendly, be excited, ask the other person questions. 
Uh, don't assume they're going to be interested in what you're interested in, but help them find that connection that you have found, which is the reason that you decided to talk to them in the first place. Um, collaborations take a lot of trust and therefore they take a lot of time. So it's like building any relationship that's based on trust and, and time. Um, and yeah, like Elena said, there are a lot of resources. Um, so if you're curious about those, you know, please be in touch with us. Um, and we can probably point you in the right direction or, or introduce you to somebody who's in your local area. Um, so, okay. Hey, um, a question for you, Jonathan, about your work. Um, it's kind of a two part question, but, uh, so, so the first part is the materials that you use. Um, how do you think about the materials that you use, uh, styrofoam, petroleum, et cetera, as it relates to your subject matter. Um, and then in terms of your scale, let me just scroll down to this one that I'm looking for. Um, yeah, the, the scale of your works uh, and the kind of the impact that they can have, you know, do you think that it's, do you think that smaller works have a different type of impact or do you think that um, in terms of your experience um, or that you're more very installation focused works, you know, really embed themselves in a certain physicality and so have a different kind of impact. So speaking to the material side of things, eco-friendly, et cetera, and your thoughts about that, and then just talking about scale for a bit. Sure, so the, yeah, I mean, I think anybody who works in, in large scale sculpture or installation or, or painting a performance or, you know, whatever like that, I, it's, I think anybody deals with this question. And I've dealt with this in, in my practice for, you know, I mean, decades now, ever since I've started working on this scale, which is, you know, I'm talking about this, the environmental impact of these materials. And yet sometimes I am using large amounts of these materials. I remember first bringing it up in grad school, like being like, how do I, you know, to my professors, I mean, like, how do I reconcile this? Um, the way that I've I've done it is first a lot of those a lot of the materials that I use are reclaimed. Um, my fiance can attest to uh, getting into our car and um, finding it filled with styrofoam that I've picked up on the street as I'm driving. <laughs> uh, a lot of um, she's very patient with me. Um, <laughs> But, um, and so that's that's one thing I also, because those works are, a lot of those works tend to be not only, you know, site specific, but exhibition, you know, specific, and they, they won't be exhibited again. Um, I cannibalize a lot of those materials. I will pull every screw out of a, you know, out of an installation as I'm deinstalling it. Um, all of the material gets cataloged, you know, wood, any kind of found materials like styrofoam, that kind of stuff gets cataloged and stored in my studio and hopefully used again in a, a future exhibition. And so even the, you know, a lot of the pieces that you've seen, a lot of those materials end up in other pieces. So that's, that's one way that I try to compensate for that the best that I can in, in my practice. I think a lot of, I mean, and again, that that's also artists need, I think in general need to be resourceful and we're, a lot of us are not independently funding our, our works um, with, you know, our own um, independent wealth, right? <laughs> Whatever that is. So um, we're- We don't uh, go into and, art to make money. Yeah, that's, right, that's right. not the driving motivation. <laughs> well, and you know, it's too, I, I, I have this thing. I mean, I, you know, I joke around about my art, but you know, I make giant, uns, you know, sure. unsellable, right? Like installation sculptures my the the joke i tell people a lot of times is like i'm i'm happy to come and ruin your home if you want <laughs> to buy you know purchase a a, a Jonathan Latino. and i have done some commissions and and things like that and 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 that has you know existed in my practice but for the most part it's it's not that and so um yeah yeah but that's that's really you know how i kind of deal with that is um again it's you know a lot a very very not a lot of the materials are raw in that sense. The the materials that don't decompose in the way that I am comfortable with them decomposing. Yeah, well, there's a lot of um, conversation every time there's 
you know, a biennial and, and works get shipped around the world on these huge ocean freighters or on, you know, airlines, et cetera. Um, whereas the line between, you know, needing to exhibit works because artwork needs to be seen in order to be meaningful um, and, you know, the, the toll that it takes. <laughs> so um, very complicated issue, which, which relates to uh, the next question, which is about, you know, how do we think about having more eco-friendly exhibits slash how do we have exhibits right now when we're not supposed to leave our house or do anything really outside with each other? Um, can virtual exhibitions be meaningful and impactful in the way that physical ones are? We know they can be meaningful and impactful. Um, that's not the question, but how do we is it possible to to have the same level of impact as a physical exhibit? Uh, I know, Elena, you've had some experience and in, in you're thinking about this. And um, I don't, you know, right now there's a virtual exhibit on Brodo's website. Um, so just thinking about how do we deal with that right now or, or how to develop it as something that's, you know, a very legitimate alternative, um, especially from your perspective. John, you make installation works. Your, you know, a picture of your work is not the experience of the work. So how would we deal with that? 